On June 15, 1989, a woman in Port St. Joe, Florida pulled off Route 98 into the parking lot of a junior food store. She parked next to a white Toyota cargo van and entered the market. Later, when she emerged with her groceries, the white van was gone, but in the vacated space besides her car, she found what appeared to be a Polaroid photo lying face down on the asphalt. She picked it up, turned it over, and the image she saw would become one of the most mysterious unsolved crimes ever. In the photo, a young woman and a young boy lie on their backs on a rumpled pile of mismatched sheets and pillows. Both look directly at the camera with expressions that can only be described as tense resignation. Their mouths are covered with duct tape, and their posture suggests that their wrists are bound behind them. The space they occupy is cramped and poorly lit. The only source of light seems to come from behind the photographer. The photo could have well been taken in the back of a windowless van with its side door pulled open. The woman who discovered the photo immediately notified local police. Roadblocks were quickly assembled, but the van or the mustached man who had been in its driver's seat were never caught. Patty Doyle and her new husband John first became aware of the Polaroid photo more than two months later on August 23rd. Relatives called to say they had just seen a photo broadcast on the TV show A Current Affair. The image showed a boy and a girl who seemed to have been kidnapped. Could it have been Patty's beloved daughter Tara Calico? At the time she disappeared, 19-year-old Tara Calico was a sophomore at the Valencia campus of the University of New Mexico, a 15-minute commute from her family's home in Bella, New Mexico. On the morning of September 20th, 1998, Tara set out from home for a bike ride along Highway 47. The plan was to ride south 17 miles to the railroad crossing and then back again. Tara had a tennis date after lunch, so she told her mother to come looking for her if she wasn't back home by noon. She set out on her mother's pink Huffy mountain bike, put a tape into her cassette player, and took off. A little past noon, Tara had not returned, so her mother Patty went off looking for her. Highway 47 cuts a razor-straight path through the barren, scrub-dotted clay east of the Rio Grande. There are few cross streets, fewer structures, and no trees. There was zero trace of Tara or the pink bicycle. However, her mother did find a cassette on the highway's dusty shoulder. Later, more searches turned up the cracked cover of a Walkman nearly 20 miles east of Bellin, close to the remote John F. Kennedy campground. To her mother, it was as if Tara had been kidnapped and had dropped whatever she could from a moving car, hoping to leave a trail that might be traced back to her. The trail dead-ended among the pines and maple trees at the foothills of the Manzano Mountains. Tara's disappearance fell into a legal no-man's land of missing people. As a legal adult, she had the right to vanish if she wanted to, and little could be done without evidence that indicated a crime had taken place. In the following days, investigators, aided by local volunteers, determined that Tara had last been seen at 11.45 a.m. on her return trip, a mere two miles east of her home. Witnesses saw a 1953 Ford pickup equipped with a homemade camper shell tailing her closely. Tara may have been unaware of the truck because of her Walkman's earphones. That Tara Calico might be the young woman in the Polaroid photo seemed like a long shot at the very best. The photo was found 1,600 miles away from where Tara was last seen and some nine months later, but there were a few significant parallels. The young woman in the photo had the right hair color and complexion. A discolored patch on the young woman's right calf corresponded to a scar Tara had received in a car accident. A tattered mass market paperback lay on the rumpled bedding next to the girl. It was My Sweet Audrina by V.C. Andrews, one of Tara's favorite authors. The girl's face looked more drawn and narrow than the most recent photos of Tara, the pictures that were on all the flyers and posters, but months had passed. Allowing that her daughter had been missing the better part of a year, and that the young woman in the photo wore no makeup, Patty felt fairly certain that the girl in the Polaroid was her daughter. But even more compelling than the girl's similar appearance was the fact that the young boy in the photograph bore a striking resemblance to another child who had gone missing in New Mexico. His name was Michael Henley, and he had vanished a mere five months before Tara, just 45 miles south of Bellin, in the Cibola National Park. This chilling link between the Polaroid and New Mexico only amplified the mystery surrounding Tara's disappearance. Had some unknown person abducted both children? On April 21st, 1988, Michael Henley of Milan, New Mexico disappeared on a camping trip in the Oso Ridge area of the Zuni Mountains. Henley's father and a family friend had brought the nine-year-old with them to hunt wild turkey. 
About 20 minutes after their arrival at the campsite, while the adults were busy setting up, Michael vanished. It seemed likely he had wandered away from the campsite and got lost in the landscape. Michael's father quickly reported him missing, but the hunt was hamstrung by a sudden high-altitude storm. Heavy snow made navigating the boulder-strewn landscape nearly impossible. To make the search yet more urgent, when last seen in the afternoon heat, Michael had only been wearing a flannel shirt, pants, and tennis shoes. 400 volunteers, state police officers, and National Guardsmen clambered through the wilderness within a 10-mile radius of the campsite, scouring every inch. Civil Air Patrol volunteers crisscrossed the sky during daylight hours as well as announcements airing on the radio. Tennis shoe tracks were found in the snow, but several searchers in the area were wearing shoes with similar soles to Michael's. There was no way to know if trackers were closing in on the missing child or wasting crucial time retracing areas that had been searched already. Months passed, and the mystery of Henley's disappearance gradually vanished from the news cycle. It seemed clear that the boy had wandered from camp, become disoriented, and died of exposure. In the final stages of severe hypothermia, incoherent victims often exhibit a behavior called terminal burrowing, in which they crawl into a tight, enclosed space for self-protection. This tendency to conceal oneself among boulders or under fallen logs can make the search for missing hikers, especially those in the deepest need, nearly impossible. In the harsh, isolated terrain where Michael was last seen, chances are his body would never be found. But then, more than a year after he went missing, the Polaroid appeared. The boy in the image lies on his left side in a powder blue t-shirt looking afraid. A swath of black duct tape masks his face from nose to chin. His eyes look at the camera plaintively. The majority of Michael's family believe that it's him. Tara's mother, Patty, and both of Michael's parents flew to Florida to speak with Port St. Joe police and examine the Polaroid firsthand. After a couple of hours discussing the case with investigators and scrutinizing the Polaroid, all three came away with the same conclusion. It was their children in that photo. That conviction was both a solace and a torment. All three parents returned home, assured that their children were alive and that someone was at least feeding and clothing them. And though the situation depicted in the Polaroid was clearly grim, Tara and Michael were together, at least they were not alone. The Polaroid was forwarded to the FBI crime labs to compare facial measurements with other photos of the missing pair. The results, however, were inconclusive. Similar authentication efforts were later run by Los Alamos National Laboratory, which concluded that Tara was not the girl in the photo. But Scotland Yard ran the same authentication test and concluded that it was Tara in the photo. Despite what might have been a major break in the case, the release of the photo, and its frequent airing on Unsolved Mysteries, America's Most Wanted, and even Oprah, stirred up lots of commotion, but no solid leads. Both families organized volunteers, printed flyers, and tried to keep the story alive in the news. Patty and her husband were sworn in as auxiliary deputies, which allowed them to contact other law enforcement offices under the auspices of the Valencia County Sheriff. Over the following weeks, sightings of Tara were reported in different locations across the South, as if her captor were still drifting from town to town. Michael was reportedly sighted in Arkansas. Each new rumor rekindled the hope that Tara and Michael would someday be returned home. At some point, wouldn't their captor slip up, or would the two suddenly decide to make a break for it? And then, in June 1990, the case took an abrupt and decisive turn. A rancher riding a fence line discovered a scattering of bones. The remains were those of a young child and they were six or seven miles from the campsite where Michael Henley had disappeared more than two years earlier. Scraps of clothing found at the scene were consistent with what Michael was wearing when he vanished. Sheriff Craig informed the boy's parents of his suspicions. One by one, other missing local children reports were accounted for. Five days later, the Cibola County Medical Examiner made a positive identification. The remains were Michael's, and his death had been a tragic accident. Michael Henley is not the boy in the Polaroid. Now that the Henley family knew with certainty what had happened to their son, they would settle into grieving and have a proper funeral. But Patty, Tara's mother, had no such closure. Whether she was conscious of it or not, she now faced a sort of choice. If the boy wasn't Michael, the only solid link to New Mexico, what were the chances that the young girl was actually Tara? The girl in the Polaroid certainly looked a lot younger than a woman of 20, and her face was narrower than most recent photos. The mark on the girl's right calf was far from distinct as a scar, and thousands of young women read the novels of V.C. Andrews. 
Despite new public doubts, Patty's conviction about the Polaroid was never shaken. In 1997, seven years after Michael Henley had been laid to rest, she weighed in on a website discussion board about the case. I am Tara's mom and would like to respond to questions that Crushed Velvet posted. Tara did not have any book with her when she disappeared. We can only guess that the abductor either gave the book to Tara because V.C. Andrews was one of the many authors that Tara read. Another possibility is that the book was placed in the photo because the ultimate subject of that book was brainwashing. Reading Tara's mom's statement, there's no hedging in her language, no if or perhaps or seems likely. In her mind, the beautiful young woman in the Polaroid was absolutely her daughter. Over the years, the hope that had come with the photo's discovery hardened into a kind of certitude, and that seemed to leave Patty in an impossible no-man's land as a parent coping with loss, uncertainty, and with hope. Patty's search for Tara never lagged. She made TV appearances, sent out hundreds of thousands of flyers, and never seemed to begrudge a press interview that might keep her daughter's story alive. A moment or opportunity was never missed to find Tara by her mom or dad, Michelle, Tara's younger sister, told Crime Magazine. It is impossible to describe in words an indescribable emotion. Unfortunately, only those who have gone through this can understand the emotions that change from year to year, month to month, day to day, and minute by minute. Over those years, two other Polaroid photos were discovered, which may or may not be photos of Tara. Neither has been released to the public. The first, discovered at a Southern California construction site, is a blurry image of a girl's face, her mouth covered with duct tape. The film used was not available until 1989, and the girl seems to be lying on a sheet similar to the blue striped pillowcase in the original photo. The final Polaroid shows a woman loosely bound and blindfolded in gauze, wearing large framed glasses. She seems to be riding an Amtrak train next to an unidentified man. The image is on film that was not available until 1990. Recent history provides us with just enough happy endings, Elizabeth Smart, J.C. Dugard, the trio of Seymour Avenue in Cleveland, to keep alive some ember of hope that Tara Calico might someday return. Tragically, at the age of 64, Patty Doyle passed away after a series of strokes. Even up until her death, Patty never gave up hope that Tara was alive somewhere. Even her newspaper obituary reflected her indomitable hope that her daughter would one day come home. Patty is survived by her husband John, four children, four grandchildren, nieces, and sisters. Tara Calico is one of those four children.